And now it's time for the catch, which takes you around the Great Lakes to hear from reporters about the issues they're covering. Some people call these fireflies and others call them lightning bugs, but whatever you call them, they're in trouble. Jenny Whitten, climate change reporter at the Daily Herald, has been looking into the dimming of the lightning bug population. 40% of all insects um, around the country are in danger of extinction, and that includes fireflies. So there are a lot of reasons for that, but one of those is climate change, and that's why I decided to take a deeper look into it. Based on her research, Jenny says the insects are in decline for three main reasons. One of those is habitat loss, and that is driven by climate change. The next culprit is light pollution. It might seem kind of intuitive if you really think about it. Lightning bugs communicate with their light. So when we have more light pollution, it's harder for them to connect with one another and to continue mating and driving up that population. And Jenny says the final factor is pesticide use. Pesticide use both individually by homeowners, but also in large scale agriculturally. That is another thing that is driving down the lightning bug population. Part of that is actually, it's quite interesting. So the larvae of lightning bugs actually live in the soil and they're also carnivorous. So if you use pesticide on the soil, not only are the larvae of the lightning bugs at risk, but their food source is also at risk. Jenny says it's important to remember that these issues are affecting the overall insect population. And if you think we're better off with fewer bugs, think again. The reasons why scientists are so concerned about this is because everything is part of a greater food web. And if there are no insects, as a result, there are no birds. And it continues down that chain. So one of the things that is a solution that people are really looking at is widespread conservation. There are things you can do to help in your own yard. One of them is letting parts of the yard get a little bit overgrown because that's where these insects really thrive. So don't use as much pesticides. I would say abstain from pesticides in those areas. Don't mow as often. The second thing is making sure that your lights that you use aren't as bright or maybe they're on a sensor so they're not on all the time distracting the fireflies. And the last thing and one of the most important things you can do is planting native plants in your yard because that's really where these insects thrive. In Syracuse, New York, reporter Glenn Coyne has been covering a story about the return of 1,000 acres to the Onondaga Nation. For the Onondaga Nation to get land back is a huge step for them. They once had land across central New York, uh, all of it taken from them by uh, treaties in New York State. And for years they have fought to get land back unsuccessfully. And so this thousand acres that they now are getting um, is, a, is a tremendous uh, start for them to, to regain some of their territory. The land transfer happened as part of a settlement between New York State and Honeywell International, one of the companies responsible for polluting Onondaga Lake. As part of the lake cleanup, which started decades ago, Honeywell had to not only clean up the lake, but also basically restore the public's use that was lost during the time the lake was polluted. Honeywell's cleanup is complete and the land transfer is supposed to happen by March. In the meantime, Glenn says Honeywell is responsible for implementing a number of projects to improve the area. The idea behind this is that the land will stay relatively pristine. The Onondaga want it that way. The state has put what's called a conservation easement on the property, which means it has to remain essentially wild. There will be some public access projects, trails and parking lots, but they'll be relatively small scale, just enough to kind of get people into it. Glenn says that the 1,000 acres returned to the Onondaga is one of the largest land transfers made to an indigenous nation in the United States. And it's the first time that land has been returned directly to a tribal entity in the state of New York. This could be the start of other lands given back to, to Indian nations in New York State, but I think it's a case by case basis. In Cleveland, a new bulk freighter is making waves in Great Lakes shipping. Great Lakes Now's Lake Erie contributor, James Prophet has the story. It was just launched a few months ago and made its inaugural visit to Cleveland, where it will service two major Cleveland corporations. The ship was commissioned by Cleveland-based Interlake Steamship Company and is named after company president Mark W. Barker. It is the first American-made bulk cargo carrier constructed uh, on the Great Lakes in about 36 years. 
The ship can move the same amount of materials as 250 railroad cars or 1,000 tractor trailer loads. But at 639 feet long, it's smaller than some other Great Lakes freighters. This allows it to maneuver more easily. The operators hope it will be able to navigate rivers and tighter dock locations without the aid of tugboats. The Barker is also more environmentally friendly than many older freighters. The Barker meets all the latest US EPA Tier 4 emissions requirements, meaning it will burn ultra low sulfur fuel, and the engines and diesel generators also are designed to create far less nitrogen oxide, particulate matter, and hydrocarbons emissions. James says the ship will move throughout the Great Lakes, transporting bulk cargo like road salt, iron ore, and coal, along with food commodities and large machinery. The Barker will definitely set a precedent in Great Lakes bulk shipping not only for its modern computer controls, its size, and its ability to get essentially into any port, but its ability to haul not just bulk cargo, but a variety of products, including wind turbines, large machinery, structural items, and even containers. Thanks for watching. For more on these stories and the Great Lakes in general, visit greatlakesnow.org. When you get there, you can follow us on social media or subscribe to our newsletter to get updates about our work. See you out on the lakes.